thank you very much for joining us. And I think now I'm going to pass over to yourself to start the presentation. Super. I'll just share my screen now. OK, brilliant. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for listening today. Um, I appreciate it's a bit off the wall talking about dentistry when uh, when when we're talking about engineering. Um, but um, the aim of today really is that I want everybody just to appreciate how much engineering there actually is in dentistry. It's often something that gets very overlooked when people thinking are thinking about what they want to do when they're older, what sort of career they want to go into. Um, hopefully after today you should be a little bit more interested in maybe becoming a dentist or anything to do with dentistry um, and just have a general appreciation of how engineering does fit into uh, to trying to uh, to look after our teeth um, also maybe just a bit of an insight into uh, into what we do so a little bit about myself first of all um, I'm very passionate about my job um, I think I think you should be um, if you want to be an engineer, have you ever thought about being a dentist? So I qualified in 2005 from Sheffield and I'm very much a general dentist. Now, there are lots of different speciality areas you can go into, like areas of medicine as well. Um, but I'm very much a general dentist. So I do a little bit of everything from go, from when people go in for their checkups to talking about the, um, how to prevent problems with the teeth to doing fillings and uh, the big smile makeovers when people need that as well. Um, I'm often describing myself as a tooth engineer and I will show you why. I have a lot of patients who are engineers and what's interesting is that I really like treating engineers because there are lots of similarities there. And when I'm explaining why treatments are needed or how treatments uh, go well or why they fail, it's often the engineers that really understand why that's happening. Um, if you ever think about being a dentist, you generally need A levels in chemistry, biology, and usually one other science as well. Um, to be a dentist, you do your A levels and then you're a five year degree, a Bachelor of Dental Surgery. Um, there are other things you can do as well. Um, I'm a member of the joint faculties at the Royal College of Surgeons, and I've got some additional qualifications in root canal treatment. There are lots of specialist areas you can go into. So what do I do? What do dentists do? Well, the biggest thing, which I think is the most important thing and often gets overlooked, is the prevention of, of dental decay, dental disease. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of dental treatment can be avoided sometimes if people understand a little bit more about looking after the teeth and why why things have happened in the mouth. So educating patients is, is a big part of what all dentists do. Unfortunately, we can't completely stop dental problems. And so um, treatment of dental disease, treatment of dental pain is obviously a hugely important part of our job. We check for lumps, bumps and essentially for cancers. Um, a lot of people are aware of different areas in your body you can get cancer. And often it, the mouth gets overlooked a little bit, but uh, it, it's very serious when it happens. So we do we do always check for any issues inside the mouth. We manage problems with the jaw joint. The jaw joint's a class three lever. Um, it's a very specialist joint in the mouth. It's a very unusual type of joint. So we need to know quite a lot about that. Um, and it really can affect people. We enhance smiles cosmetically if it's something people want. And we do our very best to actually use the teeth that people have there to move them, to, to, to lighten them, to do whatever we can with what is there um, to make them look better if people want that doing. Why do I love my job? Well, I meet lots of people. I certainly help people. I'm always trying to recruit my patients into being dentists. I have several patients at the moment that are at university because as they've chosen their, as they've been cho choosing their A-levels, I've said, think about dentistry, come and do some work experience. Um, so I do love my job and I love seeing people. And obviously things like getting people out of pain, helping people um, with their appearance if they want that. Um, problem solving, a huge part of our job. Um, it may seem simple that if somebody comes in with toothache to treat the tooth, it's often not that simple. Often toothache can mimic other things or other things mimic toothache. Um, so you do have to have a good look around. There's a lot of teeth there. You have to decide which one is causing the problem. It's not always as simple as people think. It's very hands on. So I'm using my hands every day. I'm very manually dexterous. I like that hands on approach rather than, um, you know, being behind a desk type of approach. Every day is different. 
The people I see are different. The problems that I come across are different. Satisfaction of achieving results. Yeah, the, you know, not only cosmetically um, that people are, are happy and sometimes it can be quite life changing for people, but also getting people out of pain, um, educating people. It, you do see those results there. People are happy with that. People who may be nervous that you can calm them down and then they, you know, they gain their, they gain their confidence and dentistry. And that's important. Working as a team, hugely important. Um, you go into a dental practice, there's people everywhere because you've got your nurse, you've got your receptionist, you've got your technicians who often work off, but you're sending all of your work to them or you're scanning things, sending things to them. You're often on email or on the phone to them. Um, and it's really very much a, a joint effort. And also with specialists, if there's things that um, we come across that need a specialist referral, we, we liaise very well with specialists. So why do we need teeth? Well, now what have they got to do with engineering? Well, interestingly, I looked at a definition of an engineer and uh, and 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 the, the best one I could find was saying a person who designs, builds or maintains engines, machines or structures. And I thought, yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. You know, your body is a machine, your teeth are structures and we we are maintaining them, number one. We are designing and build them if we need to. If we need to change the design of them, then that's that's our job is to start doing that. Building them, yes, if people have lost teeth, we try and build that smile back up again. Why do we need teeth? Function, eating. You know, it's why babies aren't sat at the dinner table having a three course meal. They can only they can only function so much in having milk because they don't have the teeth. Speech, hugely affected when teeth are either moved um or if any teeth are lost and obviously our smile which is a part of um our appearance and how people how people view us how we come across um you know eyes and smile hugely important the function of teeth first of all well can we cope without teeth yes we can but you're on a very very soft diet you've lost that smile um, and you've lost an amount of function and um, and speech with it when you've lost a lot of teeth. Um, I appreciate School Science Week and the theme is very much on time this year. Well, you, you probably realise that children will have 20 deciduous teeth, um, usually starts about age seven to about age 11. Um, you've got your, your 20 deciduous teeth um, and we call those deciduous teeth because like the trees with the deciduous trees where the leaves fall off it's the same with teeth they're called deciduous teeth because these 20 teeth fall out interestingly next time you go to the dentist listen to what they say and as they're reading out your teeth they'll call your deciduous teeth or your baby teeth or your milk teeth a b c d and e we we assign them a letter as an adult with all of your teeth you have 32 permanent teeth and um, we we number those one to eight because we go from the center and out one to eight like that in four sections and that's how uh, that's how we we um record which teeth are present when we restore these teeth we need to consider lots of things so you need to consider the material that needs to be used now it's um it, you don't just have any choice of material it needs to be strong because you need to be able to bite your food with it it needs to be cosmetic if it's near the front of the mouth not so much at the back of the mouth but certainly at the front of the mouth it does need to be a material that's strong but also looks it needs to be able to cope with food and also saliva so and food can be quite acidic um, saliva obviously it's got you've got wetness water moving over those teeth all day it needs to be tolerated by the body because if you do have a filling that might come out or something that comes out you need if you if you swallow it by accident your body needs to be able to tolerate that your lips against the against the, any fillings need to be able to tolerate it you need to not react to it so dental materials is a very difficult type of material science because you've got to have something that's very strong but also that your body can can uh, can cope with. So when we look at the different teeth and the formation structure of teeth, again, they're all related to engineering. Our teeth are designed in a way to help us to chew and to eat. So when you look at our incisor teeth, which is your front teeth, there's four in the upper jaw, four in the lower jaw, they're actually quite thin. 
Now, these act like a knife. If you think about eating an apple, you're going to eat the apple and you need the knife to cut into that apple. And this is what the incisor teeth do. They're the ones that bite into the apple to take that chunk off from the apple because we can't eat a whole apple, obviously. They need to be sharp because they're acting like a knife. Maybe you're restoring these teeth. So if somebody falls and breaks a tooth like this, your material needs to colour match. So it can't just be white. It needs to be the same colour as the other teeth. And that can be quite difficult. You often have to layer different um, colours together to make it look like the tooth next to it. It needs to be very, very strong but in thin section you can't have a bulky incisor you've got to make it come down to the tip but it's got to be strong even though it's thin and enamel which is the the substance naturally made and that is that's what's on your teeth is wonderful at being strong but in thin section so when that's lost there's a real engineering problem there how are we going to fix this have it look good be strong but also be very thin the next teeth are longer are canine teeth or a canine teeth. And these teeth are the ones that help us to tear meat. They're long and pointy and they actually as well protect the front teeth a lot. So when um when we do when we're talking about our canines, you might notice on your dogs or when you look at uh, you look at uh, animals that eat a lot of meat, they have really long and very thick. Uh, very strong canine teeth because they have to tear meat and that's really what our canines are designed for. The next teeth back are our premolar teeth and our molar teeth. Now these are hugely important because these are the ones that are used like a pestle and mortar to grind the food down. We need to be able to grind that piece of apple that we've cut off with our incisors we can't swallow it the way it is. It's too big. It's too chunky. It could choke us. So we need to then grind that bit of apple into a pulp. And this is what the molars do. The cusps on the molars fit together so that they interlock, so that they bite the teeth down. And also you can move your lower jaw around so that you grind that food down to make a bolus that's small enough for you to swallow without choking on it. I've said about the jaw joint being a class three lever. It's really, really important that we have our molar teeth so that we've got that function of chewing. So when we look at tooth engineering to restore the function, we often look at how much load or pressure is on the molar teeth. If there's too much pressure on those molar teeth, the teeth, the, the, the cusps break off and instead of interlocking like that, they go very flat. You're not going to be able to chew your teeth as well if you've not got those pointy cusps. We see quite a lot of acid erosion on those pointy like cusps, like the mountain tips. If you like, if you think of like a mountain range, they're like the tips of the mountains. And if you're having a lot of, say, fizzy pop or fruit juice that's very, very acidic, that enamel gets worn down. And instead of interlocking like triangles, they, they wear away against each other. If you lose the molar teeth, and a lot of people think, oh, it's only a back tooth, it doesn't really matter. But what you're then doing is putting more pressure on the smaller teeth coming forwards, and then they start to break a lot more. So that's why the molar teeth are really important to us, even though they're not in our smile. They're hugely important to protect all the teeth further forward. So we do have to look, again, tooth engineering, at the function of the teeth and how we can help to maintain or build up those back teeth to help restore function. When we're looking at tooth engineering to restore speech, this is hugely important. If a tooth is lost, speech is really affected. Now, tooth engineering means that we're trying to keep the, the maintain and keep the function of the teeth that we have. So it's a last resort to lose teeth, but sometimes we can't avoid that and teeth are lost or people aren't born with all their teeth and then we have to help them in that way. There's lots of ways of replacing teeth. You can use titanium implants to replace the root of a tooth and build a crown on top of that. So sometimes we replace single teeth or we help um, to replace multiple teeth with a few implants and then something to click onto it. If you've got a gap, but you've got two healthy teeth either side, we sometimes put a bridge across. The teeth. We put the bridge capping over the teeth either side and, uh, and, and that bridge involves closing over the gap so that it doesn't look like there's a gap anymore. Same engineering principles with any teeth, uh, with any bridges, though, you're pushing more force on the teeth either side of the gap. Sometimes we use a denture to replace missing teeth and that uses 
any bulbousness of the teeth to click into an undercut so that a denture clicks into place. Um, we, it's hugely important, we all like to be able to speak clearly, but it's especially important for people who publicly speak, singers, wind instruments, instrument players, um, they really do need to be able to use their, um, use their speech, to, to restore the function of the mouth so that their speech is unaffected. So designing smiles, if people come in and they've either had a lot of dentistry or lost a lot of teeth, or they just want their teeth that they've got to be in a better smile, we can use our creative side. So if you feel like you're good at sciences, you can't, you like the engineering side of sciences, but you're also very creative, which all engineers are, um, you can use this creative side to try and help people change their smile. We use digital smile design, which uses scanners. So we scan people's teeth, we get it up on a computer. We can decide what to move, how to move it, where it's going to fit in with your bite once you move the teeth. And we use that on, on computers to see how the smile will look at the end, how the function will be. Are we biting on enough teeth? And that all helps us to plan rather than guesswork or making something look good but then you realize that biting together doesn't work. You need to be able to plan the, the, the smile as a whole using the whole mouth. We sometimes can get a cast up of teeth, which we used to do with white wax and, um, and say, right, that's how your teeth are now. Let's move the wax and show you how the teeth are going to look. But scanners have mainly sort of taken over that. And we also use orthodontic treatment, which is braces to use your teeth and just move them into a better design a design that functions better can help look at to help to help you to look after your teeth a bit better help you to eat a bit better and also help your speech especially if the step at the front people often have a lisp we can move things using the teeth that you've got just to move them to make them function a bit better in the future of dentistry more technology will be used um, it's already coming in in leaps you know using uh, 3d printers to build our own crowns veneers bridges to, to place on people's teeth um it, it, dentistry really is coming on a lot like that there's sometimes in the media there's a lot about tooth germ um cell implants uh, to replace teeth and again it's an interesting side the one thing i would say about stem cell implants is that we're quite a way off there because they're so expensive they're so expensive to do and if you implant a stem cell it's still got to then build a tooth so you've still got that time of having a gap while the tooth builds a bit like when your teeth are coming through when you're a child so it's an interesting area of dentistry I think we're still quite a way off stem cell implants, but it is interesting. I like reading the articles about it. So that's the end of my presentation. And um, thank you very much for listening. I'm hoping that if any of you are thinking about being engineers and have an interest in chemistry or biology, you may now think about dentistry as a possible career option. Um, like I say, you need to be interested in chemistry and biology. You need to be really dexterous, so um, good with your hands if you like sewing, you like doing nails, you like doing eyelashes, you like painting small structures, anything like that. Any of those sorts of hobbies where you find that you uh, are using your hands a lot, you probably are quite manually dexterous. If you're interested in working with people, working with the public, um, you know, it is it is something to really think about. If, if dentistry is something you think about, the one thing I would say is get as much work experience as possible. Um, speak to your local dentist, to a local dental hospital see if they use any dental technicians any dental um, specialists go and do a go and see if you can stay there for an afternoon and have a look at what they do next time you go to your dentist have a chat to them about how they got into dentistry and what they'd recommend um, there's lots of ways um, that ways of thinking about engineering and and about medicine and there's a lot of crossovers there so anything like that you know if you're interested just ask people and get work experience so I think I'll be told in a minute to stop sharing my screen. And if there's any questions, please, please fire away. Thank you very much for listening. So the first question comes from Sophia in year six. And Sophia wants to know, why do we have overbites and receding chin slash jawlines? Oh, well, that's genetic, Sophia, really. Um, so again, it, it's 
why do we have it? Well, it's just how our teeth fit together in the same way that um, we all look different. Um, it's, it's just the way our teeth fit together. Now, an, an overbite is normal, but we you sometimes find that your dentist will measure things. And there is parameters of what we call normal, but it actually is functions well, looks good and helps with your speech. If something is too many millimetres one way or the other, it might affect looks, function or speech. And that's when we look at maybe braces to straighten or maybe things to straighten. What often happens is as you've got your baby teeth or your deciduous teeth and you come into your permanent teeth, your overjet, your overbite, the way your chin and everything is, is, is different. And as you grow your teeth and your jaws grow, which you won't really realize you have growth spurts in your jaw, you've got growth plates at the top of your jaw here, everything grows. And those, those millimeters change and we take those measurements quite a lot and they do change. So you probably don't realize it, but every time you go to the dentist um, from being sort of six years old to being 18, your dentist is looking at all these things and assessing them. From the minute you walk in, they're assessing how your teeth fit together. So they may not say it, but they are looking and thinking, is this person somebody who, could, who we could help with braces? Are they, are they not? Do they need it? Do they not need it? So really genetics is what makes people look like their parents and often their smile and the way their teeth are formed are often very similar to their parents. Um, I, I think I think you might have started to answer this next question actually when you talked about how our jaw moves but yeah Josh who's also in year six asks what does it why does the number of teeth increase from 20 to 32 from childhood to adulthood? Yeah so when um, when you're a child you only need those 20 teeth at the front and um, and your jaws just would not take 32 teeth. Quite honestly, a lot of adults struggle to get 32 teeth in, which is why they often lose their wisdom teeth. So that 32 teeth is including wisdom teeth. And actually, a lot of people struggle with wisdom teeth. Not everybody, but some people can't fit all the wisdom teeth in. Sometimes when you have braces, it's because there's a crowding of teeth and we need to try and straighten them out. So not, not everybody manages with 32 teeth. But really, yes, it's when you when you look at a child of four years old and then you look at an adult of 18, 19, 20, the jaws are very much bigger. So that's why we have lots more teeth. Brilliant. Um, uh, and, and it makes sense as well. I'm much bigger than a child, so it makes sense. <laughs> I've got more room for teeth. Um, this question comes in from Leo in year four, who asks, how many minutes should we brush our teeth for? Oh, two minutes. Good question. So I haven't really touched on the looking after our teeth. I have been going into schools all week telling them how to brush the teeth. But I was sort of focusing on the engineering bit. But hopefully it's made you realise how important your teeth are. So you need to brush for two minutes in the morning and two minutes in the evening. If you haven't got an electric toothbrush with a timer on, just get a little timer, a little leg timer. Somebody's put a timer on their phone or whatever. If you get a little timer and do two minutes, that really, really does help because there's lots of surfaces of our teeth to get to. And when you get into brushing for two minutes, if you have your favourite song on, they're often just over two minutes, you do get into that habit. So brush in the morning and brush in the evening. Brilliant. Um, so make sure you, we've got time for a few more questions. So make sure you get your questions in. But this question comes from Mayhill Junior School. Um, how did you start your career? What made you get into being dentists? So um, I knew I wanted to be something in science and I knew I wanted to work with either people or animals. So I looked at being a vet, I looked at being a doctor, and I looked at being a dentist. Now, interestingly, the other two jumped out more to me initially. But when I did my work experience, which is what I, I really, really stress that everybody to try and do work experience in, in lots of things. So you get an idea. The dentists all love their jobs. Um, I did a lot of work experience in being vet and I wanted to be a vet for a long time. But then I struggled sometimes when the dogs were a bit aggressive I didn't like it. And I thought, mm. actually, I'd rather work with people. <laughs> so <laughs> I have lots of dogs, but I decided I wanted to work with people. Um, the dentists love their jobs and I like the fact that you use your hands. You can be quite creative. Um, now, don't get me wrong. I'm sure you can with surgery as well. But I didn't get to do work experience with surgeons. So I, I did. It, dentistry just really jumped out at me. But I kind of knew that I wanted to go down like a scientific route. I also did some work in a lab. Um, and although I enjoyed it, I thought, no, I want to be more hands on than this. Um, so th this question comes from Calvin in year three. I like this question. What's your favourite tool to use? Oh, interesting. Mm. Um, right. I will tell you, 
my mirror, as in my big mirror, the big patient mirror, because I'm doing all my bits and the patient's lying there and doesn't know what I'm talking about. And I'm talking gibberish to my nurse, which is all dental speak. And then I give them the mirror and I say, right, this is what needs doing. This is where you're missing your brushing. This is where you're not. This is looking good. This isn't. And I think that education is really, really important. I also have a television, which unfortunately doesn't have uh, any good TV on. It has the x-rays. It has pictures. I have an intraoral camera. I take pictures of people's teeth and I put that up on a big screen and I say, right, that's what we need to look after. That's what's so important. And I think that interaction with looking so you know what looks good and what you have to work on is so so important because we don't look inside our own mouths and actually it's um it, knowledge knowledge is power knowledge is control if you know what you're supposed to be doing you do it a that little bit better my dentist doesn't do that that's a great idea being able to yeah. see what they're talking about Oh, I'm going to suggest that. Um, so we've got to see. We've got time for a few more questions. This question comes in from Letty, and Letty asks: Does the size of your tongue affect your teeth and jaw? Interesting. Actually, Letty, it can do. Yes, and again, it's a genetic thing. Um, some people do have very big, big tongues and what we call a tongue thrust that comes forward. And that can affect how you have your braces on. Um, your tongue is very, very muscular. And actually, it can affect how how dentistry happens, because sometimes you're trying to to restore a tooth and try and keep that tooth dry. And somebody has a really, really big tongue. So, yeah, it, it can affect it, actually. Yes. Um, so we've made a question and sorry, I didn't I didn't catch who, who asked it, but I thought it was a really interesting question. There we go. It's from Mayhill Junior School. How do you cope with difficult situations? I imagine it, it can be tense sometimes when you're in the middle of being a dentist. Um, yeah, so difficult situations can come whenever, whenever you're doing tricky, um, manually dexterous work and whenever you're working with the public. So when you're working with other people, difficult situations tend to be sometimes nervousness, sometimes that lack of control people don't know. Again, that's where you're saying, right, this is what we want to do today. This is what we're going to have a chat about. Come in my room, don't have to sit in my dental chair, sit in the chair over there and we'll have a chat. What don't you want to do? What do you want to do? Let me explain. And I think when people know what's going on and have an understanding of, of why they're there and given their options, people, you know, people are generally absolutely fine then. They, they um, you know, I do stress to my patients, it's your mouth, you know, you need to know what, what what's going on. Um, so patients generally difficult situation tend to be maybe patients a bit nervous and then mm. they just once they know what's happening they're fine difficult situations maybe in the mouth like a big tongue yeah that can be <laughs> that can be a difficult situation but we generally have a good laugh about it and you know it takes a bit more time and and, and we get there in the end and you know patients always always walk out happy always brilliant and again it sounds like in a difficult situation you just talk to them because like you say yeah. you like working with people and it helps absolutely absolutely i talk a lot <laughs> <laughs> um so i think we've got time for two more questions this question comes from eva who's also in year six what food is best for our teeth and i've got a question is there food that's good for your teeth yeah great question well yeah i mean obviously we have to eat so um so we look at the the best food for our teeth to help maintain our teeth is um things like cheese is very good because it's not very acidic um so cheese is cheese is a, a great food for our teeth but like like anything it's it's about um it's about um uh moderation everything in moderation so cheese is great we don't want to eat cheese all day do you so you have your breakfast just make sure that you you're brushing your teeth so you're getting the toothpaste onto your teeth because toothpaste is really good for teeth uh milk water really good for our teeth um really anything without sugar in so things like toast and you know savory food is absolutely fine for our teeth when we do have something sugary which we all do and um, just try and keep it to with a meal so that you're having a slightly higher sugar attack then but between say our lunch and our tea we it, our saliva buffers away that acid and everything goes back to neutral again so yeah things things that are savory just try and avoid having lots of sugary food that tends to be bad for our teeth um but yeah savory food is is absolutely fine for our teeth um, so I, I think we'll end on this question. A few people have asked it, but this question comes from Evelyn. What would happen if you never went to the dentist? Well, that's a really interesting question. 
there's a difference between if you never went to the dentist and you don't brush your teeth and you eat lots of sugar mm. to if you never went to the dentist but you brush your teeth beautifully two minutes in the morning two minutes in the evening um you looked after your teeth really really well by not having a high sugar diet um you've as you got adult teeth you flossed very well and looked after your teeth some people can go a long time without going to the dentist the problem is if something occurs your dentist can spot it quicker than you can mm. and by the time you turn up at the dentist with a problem like you've got pain or you've noticed something go black or broken or whatever then the dentist is dealing with something that may have been prevented or they're dealing with a bigger cavity so a bigger filling or the tooth may need to be lost so it's that prevention that's not there and picking things up early that's not there so the reason we encourage you to go to the dentist is is to gain knowledge so that you can go home and look after your teeth. I mean, a lot of people go to the dentist every six months. You know, if if you're not brushing your teeth in that six months time, it doesn't matter how often you're going to the dentist, you're going to get problems. So it's the bigger the, the bigger um, thing that you can do to look after your teeth is prevent problems by looking after them beautifully at home. But your dentist is then helping you look after your teeth by helping prevent any any problems by picking anything up early. Brilliant. Well, just looking at the time, I think we're going to bring this interview to an end. So I'd just like to say thank you to everyone for joining us, but a massive thank you to Elaine for giving us plenty to stick our teeth into and also inspiring all the engineers in the making out there. Because everyone, it is your turn to come up with your own engineering ideas. Um, remember and send them to us once you've finished so we can get our certificates sent out to you and we'll hopefully see you all in person at our exhibitions at the end of the school year. Now remember, the deadline is March 22nd for submissions, so once you've got your ideas down in class, get them sent to us and we'll get our certificates out. But once again, thank you to everyone and a huge thank you to Elaine. And remember, if you were an engineer, what would you do?